On a quiet night in 1982, Italian banker Roberto Calvi is on the run. He has spent a lifetime working for Banco Ambrosiano, a bank whose biggest customer is the Vatican. But now, he's a fugitive, desperately trying to escape the long arm of the law. An Italian smuggler arranged for him to be driven overnight to Austria, where he shuttled between several cities for a few days before boarding a private charter in Innsbruck for a flight to London. After arriving in London, he finally can catch his breath. He has no idea what fate awaits him. The body of a missing Italian financier, Roberto Calvi, the central figure in a $790 million bank fraud scandal, was found hanging from a London bridge Friday, the police said today. Mr. Calvi, dismissed as head of Italy's second largest private bank, had been missing for nine days. The police said a stroller came across his body early Friday, hanging from the scaffolding of Blackfriars Bridge over the Thames River in the heart of London's financial district. For centuries, the Catholic Church has been a monumental pillar of human history. From the echoing halls of the Vatican to the humblest of rural chapels, its influence has permeated every corner of the globe. But it is also a powerful financial institution with the world's largest real estate collections and vested interests in a vast number of corporations. The Vatican owns more than 5,000 church and investment properties around the world. A central office at the Catholic Church revealed for the first time Saturday, according to several news outlets. Well, I think every Catholic who reads a story like this ends up caring because in the end they want to know where their money is going. The Vatican's need to generate revenue like any large institution has occasionally led to decisions that some could perceive as morally ambiguous. It is the height of the Renaissance, and Italy is the epicenter of this movement, with major contributions in painting, sculpture, literature, and architecture. Around this time, the Vatican is a powerful entity in Europe, exerting considerable political power, influencing rulers, and governing a substantial territory in central Italy known as the Papal States. To maintain its power, the Vatican needs an ever-growing source of income. It relies on a brilliant strategy to take Vatican finances to the next level, selling indulgences. The church found the money it needed in the selling of so-called indulgences, a sixth century invention whereby the faithful paid for a piece of paper that promised that God would forgo any earthly punishment for the buyer's sins. The Vatican set prices according to the severity of the sin and they were initially available only to those who made a pilgrimage to Rome. This strategy has brought significant income to the Vatican, causing its assets to skyrocket. But what the church doesn't realize is that this strategy for generating extra income is quickly getting out of control. The licentious lifestyle of the papal court and the widespread abuses in selling indulgences became a rallying cry for Martin Luther and the Reformation. Ultimately, Martin Luther's Reformation transforms the religious world but for the Catholic Church, it also represents a major financial setback. But approaching the end of the 18th century, the Vatican will suffer an even worse financial catastrophe. In 1789, a crisis is brewing in France. After decades of growing anger with the government, a revolution erupts, culminating in the overthrow of the monarchy and the establishment of a republic. Europe is thrown into chaos once again. But one man uses this chaos as a ladder, Napoleon Bonaparte, who rises to power in the aftermath of the revolution. He immediately sees the advantage of controlling the papacy. By 1798, French forces have invaded Rome itself, proclaiming a Roman Republic and effectively ending papal rule over the city. Pope Pius VI dies on August 29, 1799, in Valence, France, still in French captivity. The fall of the Vatican and the subsequent death of Pope Pius VI nearly bring the Roman Catholic Church to an end. In the 1830s, 
After the upheaval of the Napoleonic Wars and the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the Papal States are restored to Papal control. But the Vatican is in a dire financial situation. Desperate for enough funding to remain operational, the Church reaches out to an unlikely financier, the Rothschilds. In the 1830s, the Rothschild banking dynasty established itself as a key player in international finance. By stationing its members across key European cities, Frankfurt, London, Paris, Vienna, and Naples, the Rothschilds were extensively involved in government finance, issuing bonds and lending money to states, especially during times of distress when higher interest rates could be charged. And, at the time, there is one powerful entity in Europe in such financial distress. In 1831, Gregory XVI became Pope. He knows the Vatican might not survive long unless there is an immediate cash infusion. For the first time in the Church's history, the Vatican decides to borrow money from the most prominent Jewish banker. James de Rothschild, head of the family's Paris-based headquarters, becomes the official papal banker. One of his brothers, Carl, who runs the family's Naples branch, begins traveling to Rome to consult with the Pope. Their financial empire prompted a mixture of envy and resentment among church officials. Most traditionalists, who referred to James as the leader of international Jewry, were appalled that the church had resorted to Christ killers for financial succor. French poet Alfred de Vigny wrote that a Jew now reigns over the Pope and Christianity. He pays monarchs and buys nations. The Rothschilds lend the Vatican 40 million euros in today's money. It becomes a lifeline that the church desperately needs. The unlikely alliance is forged, and with the Rothschilds' influence, the church begins a series of financial reforms, which mean more ways for the church to accumulate assets. Historically, the Vatican collected money through what is called Peter's Pence. It dates back to at least the 8th century and has its roots in England where Anglo-Saxon kings collected annual tax for the land to support the Pope. This donation, known traditionally as Romiscot, was collected on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul and was sent to the Pope as a gesture of solidarity and support for the papacy. But for the Catholic Church at the time, that income source alone is not sufficient and they soon begin to sell bonds to the Catholic faithful. These bonds are essentially financial instruments that individuals can purchase, thereby loaning money to the Vatican with the promise of repayment, often with interest. This method allowed the Vatican to raise the necessary funds while engaging the faithful directly in supporting the papal mission. But the Vatican doesn't stop there. As the capital market system is being adopted across Europe, the Vatican Bank with vast amounts of gold, needs to diversify into other assets and grow its wealth. And the Vatican begins investing in real estate across Rome, buying up properties and renting them out to generate income. But the church also realizes the potential of stocks and begins investing heavily in the stocks of the Bank of Rome, hoping to grow the wealth of the church. The investment in the Bank of Rome has been a profitable one, Within years of investing in the bank's stocks, it has created huge profits for the church. As the Vatican emerges onto the financial market as a major player, many companies and even countries begin to view the Vatican as a partner to do business with. One of them is Germany. After the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary by a Serbian nationalist, Europe is once again thrown into war on a scale unprecedented in world history. As the war escalates, Pope Benedict XV, who assumed the papacy in 1914, finds himself navigating a treacherous path between the warring nations. The war has caused a lot of financial strains on the church. Remember, the church's major income comes from donations from various countries. During wartime, people simply don't have the money or the time to donate. But Germany sees the importance of having the Vatican as an ally. Germany also knows that it can't just give money to the Vatican outright. 
Germany was covertly funneling cash to the church through Swiss banks and labeling it Peter's Pence. That helped stabilize the church's finances. The German foreign ministry separately sent the Vatican cash from a propaganda slush fund, and the Austrians joined with a clandestine subsidy to Benedict. And it soon becomes clear that the Vatican is an ideal party for covert money operations. The Vatican realizes that it needs a professional to manage its growing financial empire. And soon, they find the perfect man for the job. Bernardino Nogara grew up in a middle-class farming family with Jewish lineage near Lake Como. But Nogara was a devout Catholic who graduated with honors in industrial and electrical engineering from Politecnico di Milano. Starting in the mining industry, Nogara quickly develops a reputation for his financial acumen, especially his ability to manage risk. His career propels him to become the Italian delegate to the Ottoman Public Debt Council and to participate in the Versailles Peace Conference after World War I. But for Nogara, a bigger opportunity awaits. After a masterly speech by Premier Mussolini, the Senate this evening, by 315 votes to 6, approved the Lateran treaties affecting the pacification of the church and state in Italy amidst stirring scenes of enthusiasm. In 1929, the country of Italy and the Vatican reached a landmark agreement. Known as the Lateran Pax, it creates Vatican City as its own country, allowing the Pope to rule it. As part of the agreement, the government of Italy pays the Holy See 750 million Italian lira in cash and 1 billion lira in government bonds. With this sudden increase in capital, the Vatican needs a man capable enough to manage it. Nogara was very well connected, even though there were some whispers about the family's Jewish background. He seemed like a very faithful Catholic and had a really strong financial expertise. So Pope Pius chose him to handle the significant funds that came from the Lateran Pacts. Within just months after Nogara becomes the banker for the church, a global crisis erupts. Premier Mussolini delivered in the Senate a frank and caustic speech on Italy's financial and economic situation in which he blamed this country's ills on the depression in America. Initially, after the crash of 1929, there was a V-shaped recovery, and people thought it was just a temporary stock market glitch, but the real economic depression didn't really hit until two and three years later. By 1932, the Great Depression has reached and spread all over Europe. The Vatican sees its assets lose 30% of their value, and its debt payments mount. To tackle the financial difficulty, Pope Pius XI gives Nogara full authority to do whatever is necessary to help save the Vatican's finances. For Nogara, it is the biggest challenge he has ever faced. He knows that if he lets the Vatican go bankrupt, all the blame will fall on him, and he may go down as one of the most hated people in history. To boost finances, he asked the Pope to declare 1933 a holy year to boost donations from believers. Nogara also begins to hedge against any potential financial downfall by loading up on gold. The way we like to describe gold is it's a hedge against debasement. Let's go back to the word debasement. Where does it come from? It means adding base metals into precious metals. You're debasing the gold. So if you own pure gold, it's a really good hedge against debasement. He also begins to buy up real estate at low prices in France, Britain, and Switzerland. At the same time, he notices price discrepancies with various government bonds he sees an opportunity for arbitrage. To ensure his actions don't draw unnecessary attention to the church, he establishes a network of holding companies to manage these investments discreetly, ensuring confidentiality and minimizing political and financial exposure. Thanks to his trading strategy and financial acumen, the church avoids another financial collapse by 1936. His strategic investments position the church for an unprecedented recovery, especially with its real estate holdings soaring in value. Bernardino Nogara is now one of the most important and powerful men in the Vatican. 
The Vatican may have bounced back from the Great Depression, but little does it know that another global crisis is about to erupt. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland, showing the world just how powerful the country has become. What Hitler's army introduced was the onset of mechanized warfare. So this is tanks supported by infantry, artillery supporting them. And then on top of that, you had tactical air support. They're all coordinated, synchronized, harmonized, and moving very, very rapidly. Back in Italy, Mussolini's government is preparing to make a move as well. Nogara sees a great risk with the potential global conflict. He realizes the urgency to safeguard the Vatican's assets. The way to do this is by moving assets to neutral countries at the time, namely Switzerland and the United States. But America won't remain neutral for long. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. After the Pearl Harbor attack, America is drawn into the war. The U.S. also begins economic sanctions on Axis powers, including Japan, Germany, and Italy, with asset freezes and import controls. This is where Nogara's talent really shined. His goal was solely focused on maximizing and safeguarding the church's wealth. And because of his strategic investments in America, he was able to secure exemptions from the U.S. economic sanctions. And he doesn't stop there. To better navigate the financial environment during World War II, Nogara realizes that the Vatican should have its own bank one that has the ability to operate in complete secrecy and without any transparency. On June 27, 1942, the Vatican establishes the Istituto per le Opere di Religione, also known as the Vatican Bank. The IOR operated without the need to disclose its financial statements or activities publicly, did not pay taxes, and was not required to show profits. It also had the unique ability to destroy its files every decade. It's a perfect vehicle to hide and launder money. By 1945, Nazi officials realize that they are losing. They turn to the Vatican Bank to help move their money. It is estimated that the Nazis stole $598 million. This is 1945 dollars worth of gold. Around 200 million Swiss francs worth of gold are allegedly funneled through the Vatican Bank and possibly transferred onwards to South America. And it doesn't stop there. The Vatican also begins helping Nazi fugitives escape to South America as well. U.S. intelligence had concluded that Archbishop Antonio Caggiano, a close Peron ally, was a conduit between the Italian escape networks and the South American church and that the Vatican as an institution, not merely as a group of scattered rogue clerics, was helping high-ranking Nazis escape justice. In the aftermath left by World War II, the continent lies in ruins. From the smoldering ashes of once great cities to the shattered lives of millions, Europe now needs rebuilding. To take full advantage of Europe's resurgence, Noguera realizes there are two industries in which the Vatican must invest heavily, the construction industry and the banking industry. Confident that any recovery would include the financial sector, Noguera's team went on a buying binge of Italian banks. By 1950, the IOR owned a share or had a majority interest in 79 of the country's banks. Real estate has been, and perhaps, always will be a profitable business for the church. In 1956, the church made millions just by selling lands to Italy to prepare for the Summer Olympics. As the Vatican Bank widens its financial empire across different countries, it needs someone with legal expertise to streamline transactions and investments. And in the late 1950s, an up-and-coming financial hustler is looking for an opportunity 
to make a name for himself. His name is Michel Sindona. Michel Sindona grows up in a poverty-stricken family in 1920. But even as a young man, Sindona shows an above-average ability with numbers. Michel Sindona's aptitude for math wins him a full scholarship to the University of Messina. But after graduation, he feels stuck at a dead-end job. He knows that to become rich, he must be willing to take risks that others don't have the guts to take. Soon, he finds his groove, helping wealthy people and organizations evade taxes, including the Mafia. At the beginning of the 1950s, he traveled to New York and met with the Gambito family. In 1957, he had become closely associated with them and was chosen to manage their profits from heroin sales. His ability to help people avoid taxes means he can maximize profit for his clients. It is a skill highly desired by the Vatican. In early 1959, the future Pope of the Catholic Church, Montini, John XXIII, wants to build a retirement home called Casa Madonina. But he wants to raise money secretly and quickly. So, he turns to Sindona for help. Sindona was able to raise $2 million needed for the project in a single day. This kind of speed of moving money around will come really handy for the church in the future. In the end, working with Sindona will be one of the worst mistakes the church has ever made. But in the meantime, the church is poised to make more tax-free money than at any other time in its history. As the Vatican's finance becomes more global, the church promotes Cardinal Paul Marcinkus as the president of the Vatican Bank. Marcinkus grew up in a working class American family. He was educated at Quigley Preparatory Seminary and later at the University of St. Mary of the Lake in Mundelein, Illinois, where he was ordained a priest in 1947. The six-foot-three American-born Marcinkus seemed more like a football lineman than a low-ranking clerical bureaucrat assigned to the Secretary of State's office. When he drank whiskey, he did not hide the bottle when a senior cleric walked into the room. He smoked cigars and did not ask permission before lighting one. As an American working for the Vatican, Marcinkus was a very great diplomat. He was adept at handling all the international assignments given by the church and he managed to become a part of the inner circle of the Pope. For Marcinkus, his predecessor Nogara's achievements loom large. He knows that although he doesn't have that financial genius, he is determined to accomplish great things for the Vatican by working with smart financiers, people like Sindona and Roberto Calvi. Roberto Calvi grew up in a banking family his father was a prominent banker. At a young age, his father showed him there was only one business worth getting into, the business of money. From the very beginning, he learned that by networking and moving money around, it was possible to build a fortune without having to create or build anything himself. In 1960, while working at Banco Ambrosiano, a bank cater to Catholic clients, Calvi has the major breakthrough when Sindona introduces him to Marcinkus. As the new president of the Vatican Bank, Paul Marcinkus is criticized for his lack of financial training. Marcinkus believes that in order to make up for that shortcoming, he needs to do something big. And Calvi could be just the guy to make it happen for him. Unlike his predecessor, Nogara, he lacked the ability to master the complexities of international finance. Some speculate that Marcinkus, being financially illiterate, was easily taken advantage of by Calvi and Sindona. Mastering complexity is an essential skill for all finance practitioners. It entails an understanding of probability, data visualization, and game theory. A fantastic place to effectively learn these critical subjects is Brilliant.org. It is a platform where learning is active featuring thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. One common trait among successful financiers I have covered is their proficiency with numbers. 
with the majority enjoying playing card games. Developing a strong intuition for statistics can provide a critical edge in finance. Brilliant's introduction to probability lays a solid foundation for mastering any number-related subjects, while their data visualization course helps you make sense of complex data. The best part? You will find them much easier and faster to master than any traditional methods. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem-solving that lets you interact with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit Brilliant.org slash Phineas or click the link in the description. You also get a 20% off an annual premium subscription. As the chief at the Vatican Bank, Marcinkus wants to greatly expand the bank's business and operation to a global scale. Roberto Calvi immediately sees this as an opportunity to prove himself to Marcinkus. At the time, the Vatican Bank and Banco Ambrosiano wanted to engage in more aggressive, riskier, and more profitable businesses. But being in Italy, they face a lot of regulations. An obvious way to circumvent this was by creating satellite banks in other countries with little to no regulations. Calvi decides to partner with Sindona, and together they form Cisalpine Overseas Bank in the Bahamas. This bank will serve as a vehicle to channel Vatican money discreetly and use that to enter the global market, especially the American market. With the backing of the tax-free money from the Vatican, Calvi and Sindona decide to go on a buying spree. In Italy, he and Calvi bought La Centrale Financiaria, a financial holding company that had long been on his wish list. And at the behest of Graham Martin, the American ambassador to Italy, Sindona purchased an influential Rome-based English-language newspaper, The Daily American. For Sindona, there is a grand prize waiting for him. The Lowe's Corporation announced yesterday that it had sold a block of one million shares of the Franklin New York Corporation, the parent company of the $3.3 billion Franklin National Bank, to Fasco International Holdings, AG, which is wholly owned by Michelle Sindona, an extremely wealthy but little-known Italian financier. Franklin National Bank is the 18th largest bank in America at the time of the takeover. With assets valued at $3.4 billion, Michelle Sindona has gone from an Italian lawyer to a banking tycoon in America. Within just a few short years, Calvi and Sindona have grown their own financial empires bigger and faster than almost anyone. With the protection and backing of the Vatican Bank, no one can touch them. There is but one exception. After taking over Franklin National Bank, Sindona begins to engage in risky foreign exchange trades using the bank. Soon enough, the bank incurs tens of millions in losses. The outflow of deposits from the Franklin National Bank increased somewhat during the week ended Wednesday. As a result, the bank has now lost nearly 24% of its deposits since its troubles first came to light on May 10th. 4,000 miles away from the US, Sindona's investment in Italian banks also begins to fail. This must have been a really chaotic period for Sindona. He tried to use his legal expertise by merging various banks together to high losses. Sindona hopes that as a major U.S. bank, Franklin National Bank will survive through a government bailout. But he has no idea what is about to happen. The Franklin National Bank was declared insolvent yesterday in the largest bank failure in American banking history. The institution was immediately taken over by the European American Bank and Trust Company, a New York State chartered entity owned by six of the largest banks in Europe. By the early 1970s, Sindona's world is collapsing down on him. The Italian authorities have liquidated all of his assets in Italy and seek the extradition of Sindona from the U.S. And with Franklin National's collapse, the U.S. Justice Department is also looking to indict Sindona. With the complete collapse of Sindona's empire, one man sees an opportunity to exploit and profit from the situation for himself.
With his former partner in peril, Calvi realizes that he can take over Sindona's assets for pennies on the dollar and use that to deepen his ties with the Vatican. So he essentially claimed the stocks that Sindona used to own in these various shell companies and satellite banks, making himself the largest shareholder in all of these firms. And with Sindona in jail, the Vatican's international business is now mostly in the hands of Calvi. The Ambrosiano and the Vatican Bank were shuffling back and forth tens of millions of dollars between their many offshore companies. The IOR by this time had loaned or invested $175 million in Calvi-backed offshore companies. But Sindona, desperate, is not about to back down from Calvi. He begins to threaten and attempt blackmail against his former partner. Sindona tries to force Calvi to provide financial help to cover his spiraling legal costs and to support him through fraudulent schemes. Under pressure, Calvi gives in. He diverts substantial funds to Sindona. This includes a significant transaction where Calvi is forced to wire $500,000 to Sindona's account under duress. But for Sindona, it isn't enough. He demands more payment from Calvi. When Calvi refuses, Sindona tips off journalists about Calvi's secret Swiss bank accounts leading to massive public and legal scrutiny. In just three years, Calvi struggles to keep his financial empire afloat amid mounting legal and financial pressures. His own financial empire is crumbling. By 1982, Roberto Calvi realizes that his financial schemes cannot be sustained any longer. On the night of June 10th, he decides to flee Italy for London. From Mugia, an Italian smuggler arranged for him to be driven overnight to Austria, where he shuttled between several cities for a few days before boarding a private charter in Innsbruck for a flight to London. He spent the last three days of his life in flat 881, a tiny room at the Chelsea Cloisters, a dreary guest house in the capital's posh South Kensington district. The body of a missing Italian financier, Roberto Calvi, the central figure in a $790 million bank fraud scandal, was found hanging from a London bridge Friday, the police said today. Mr. Calvi, dismissed as head of Italy's second largest private bank, had been missing for nine days. The police said a stroller came across his body early Friday, hanging from the scaffolding of Blackfriars Bridge over the Thames River in the heart of London's financial district. No doubt that Calvi had a strong connection with the Vatican. His activities helped bring a lot of money into the church, but as Banco Ambrosiano came close to failing, threatening to reveal more than just financial losses, this has turned Calvi from an asset to a liability for the Vatican. Could it be that those who once offered him protection have turned their backs, or worse, orchestrated his demise to silence his confessions? Michel Sindona, who at the time was a disgraced banker and former ally of Calvi, he became yet another potential suspect. Their partnership used to be very profitable for both of them, but now it has gone bad because of the accusations and betrayals. Sindona was very clever, and he was also facing his own legal problems. He might have seen Calvi's downfall as a final chess move. In the cutthroat world of high finance and higher stakes, Revenge is more than just a motive, it is a statement. The darkest possibility is the Mafia. Calvi had been their money manager, laundering large amount of money through the complex network of Banco Ambrosiano. But working for the Mafia came with a huge risk. His death, set up like a dramatic public execution under a bridge named Blackfriars, looks like a Mafia killing a warning written in the criminal world's record. In the end, the Vatican decides to publicly acknowledge that it was a mistake to work with Calvi, but denies that it has anything to do with his death. The church agrees to pay $244 million in a legal settlement involving Banco Ambrosiano. The public scandal is a huge blow to the church. Seeing their money being misused, Catholics around the world decide to lower their contributions to the Vatican, leading to a budget deficit for the church from around 1984 to 1985. 
After the death of Calvi, Sindona fights hard to avoid being extradited to Italy because he knows that may just be a death sentence for him as well. But on March 30th, 1985, Italian authorities successfully extradite Michel Sindona to Italy. Sindona's worst fear comes true. Michel Sindona, one of Italy's most successful financiers, whose empire collapsed amid charges of fraud and murder, died today in a Voghera hospital of cyanide poisoning. He was 65 years old. His mysterious death removed from the scene a man who was at the center of many of Italy's most important recent financial and political scandals. Sendona was one's mafia's favorite member, but things changed when his golden touch failed, losing millions in mafia's money through bat management and the eventual collapse of his financial empire. The mafia, like the Gambito family, known for their ruthlessness, rarely forgives such a mistakes. His fall from grace makes him a marked man. His knowledge and potential cooperation with authorities make him a dead one. The cyanide-laced coffee could easily have been the Mafia's closing statement, a signature act of retribution. Their reach extends even behind bars, and the message is clear. Betrayal, real or perceived, is a deadly sin with only one atonement. Archbishop Paul Mesinkus had long dealt with the murky finances of the Vatican. His partnership with Sindona had been very extensive and secretive. But as Sindona's usefulness decreased and his risks increased, rumors of his potential testimony involving Vatican-backed operations turned him from a helpful ally into a threat. Could it be that Marcinkus, acting on a higher directive or his initiative, orchestrated Sindona's silent assassination to forever seal those lips that threatened to speak? With the permanent silence of Calvi and Sindona, the Vatican's secret dealings with them may be permanently buried. But what they don't know is that their trouble is far from over. Italian authorities last week issued a warrant for the arrest of Archbishop Paul C. Martinkus but it did not appear that they would be confronting him anytime soon. For the Vatican, if an archbishop is arrested, the publicity will be a huge blow to the church, and it will likely destroy the beliefs of many of the faithful, leading to even less donations from them. Remember, the Vatican is its own sovereign state, so they don't have to let any country arrest any of their own people. So the church fought really, really hard against Italian jurisdiction over Marcinkus. The Vatican, throwing its full weight behind Archbishop Paul C. Marcinkus, issued a sharply worded statement today expressing profound astonishment at efforts by the Italian authorities to arrest the American head of the Vatican Bank and two of his closest associates. Despite being implicated in the massive financial scandal surrounding the collapse of Banco Ambrosiano in 1982, Marcinkus manages to avoid legal consequences, primarily due to the legal protections afforded by his position within the Vatican. In the 1990s, the Vatican Bank faces unprecedented scrutiny and scandal. The institution struggles under the weight of corruption allegations and financial mismanagement. With the retirement of Marcinkus, the church is eager to look for a replacement that can restore the trust of the Vatican Bank. The church was looking to hire Angelo Caloia, a respected banker known for his commitment to ethical finance. Caloia is the CEO of Medio Credito Lombardo, a prominent merchant bank in Milan. Notably, he is deeply involved in the Catholic financial community as a leading member of the Group for Culture, Ethics, and Finance. The church realizes to help repair the damaging reputation left by Marcinkus, Caloia is the perfect candidate for the job. The Vatican today turned over the management of its scandal-tainted bank to financial experts not connected with the clergy, ending the 20-year presidency of Paul C. Marcinkus, an American archbishop. During the first few years, Angelo Caloia battles internal resistance and attempts reforms. With secret accounts, 
illicit financial flows, and high-profile legal challenges, the bank's struggles highlight significant governance issues. The results of Kaloya's initiatives are mixed. The IOR continues to face legal and ethical challenges. The Vatican and Kaloya may have been focused on fixing the church and its finances, but their problems are about to be dwarfed. A crisis is brewing, one that will expose a darkness far greater than any financial misdeeds. Cardinal Bernard Law, who protected the priest accused of molesting more than 130 children, is under growing pressure to resign himself. Boston's Bernard Cardinal Law breaks his silence and apologizes in the case of a former priest accused of molesting children. More than 130 people have accused this man, John Gagan, of assaulting them over three decades. And dozens have charged that Cardinal Law and the Catholic Church protected Gagan. In 2002, a series of reports by the Boston Globe's investigative team, known as the Spotlight Team, uncovers a pattern of sexual abuse by priests in the Boston Archdiocese, as well as efforts by church leaders to cover up the incidents and protect the abusers. The escalating sexual abuse scandal involving a few priests has shaken not just the American Catholic Church, but also the Vatican. Pope John Paul II has summoned U.S. Cardinals for a meeting next week in Rome. The meeting will provide, quote, guidelines aimed at restoring a sense of safety and tranquility to families and trust to clergy and the faithful. While the scandal is initially most prominent in the United States, similar allegations soon emerge worldwide, including in Ireland, Australia, Canada, and various countries in Europe and Latin America. As a result of the scandal, the Vatican faces a financial fallout on a scale they have never seen in its recent past. The scandal crushes the faith of many Catholics around the world. Many dioceses worldwide face enormous financial burdens due to settlements and legal costs associated with sex abuse cases. This leads to some dioceses, like Portland, Oregon, declaring bankruptcy. Others have to liquidate assets close schools, or tap into clergy pension and retirement funds to cover settlements and legal expenses. The scandal affects the Catholic Church's income, particularly contributions to the Peter's Pence Collection, which supports Vatican activities. Amid the scandal and the financial difficulties, Pope John Paul II passes away on April 2, 2005. After the passing of Pope John Paul II, a surprising candidate rises to the top and gains the votes to become the next pope. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger becomes the first German pope in a thousand years. He became pope at a very peculiar time. The church, and particularly the Vatican Bank, was still acting with a lot of secrecy and backroom dealings. There was a demand from everyone else for more transparency and adherence to regulations in different countries. As the new Pope, Benedict makes efforts to increase transparency and compliance within the Vatican's financial institutions, particularly the Vatican Bank. To repair the broken image left by the sex scandal, Benedict takes significant steps to address the clergy sexual abuse crisis. He is the first Pope to meet with abuse victims, an action he repeats in several countries but none of his actions will prevent the storm that happens next. The Pentecostal Mass at St. Peter's Basilica. It is normally a moment of celebration, but these are difficult times for the leader of the Catholic Church. His Holy See at the center of scandal. Just hours before, the Pope's personal butler, Paolo Gabrielli, was charged with possessing confidential papal papers. In 2012, Paolo Gabriele, the butler to Pope Benedict, steals and leaks documents exposing internal Vatican correspondence, including letters and memos between high-ranking officials. They reveal a range of issues, such as allegations of corruption, financial mismanagement, power struggles, and internal conflict within the Vatican hierarchy. The leaks caused huge embarrassment to the Vatican, exposing deep rifts 
and power struggles. They led to widespread media coverage and public scrutiny, adding pressure to an already embattled institution grappling with various scandals. The Vatican condemns the leaks and initiates an internal investigation, which leads to the identification and arrest of Gabriele. He is subsequently tried and found guilty of theft in October 2012, receiving a sentence of 18 months in prison, which is later commuted by Pope Benedict XVI as part of a papal pardon. By 2012, the pressure that Pope Benedict XVI faces is immense. At the same time, the U.S. lists the Vatican as a concern for money laundering. The State Department has put the Vatican on a list of countries of concern for money laundering or other financial crimes. Robert Mickens, correspondent for the Catholic weekly The Tablet, says it's suspected that the Vatican Bank is run like an offshore bank. You know, like a Swiss bank account, hiding funds. It's suspicion, but many of the regulators think it's well-founded suspicion. To make matters worse for the church, Italy's central bank blocks electronic payments in the Vatican due to its non-compliance with EU regulations. A month later, Pope Benedict makes a shocking announcement. And welcome back to ABC Action News on this early Monday morning. We're following breaking news as you wake up and get your day started. Uh, the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, announcing just a little over half an hour ago that he is stepping down as leader of the Catholic Church. This is an unprecedented move in modern times. It's been many hundreds of years since a Pope resigned while in office. Most of them, of course, die while in office. The situation facing the Vatican may seem dire, and the next Pope is going to change all of that. Jorge Mario Bergoglio was born on December 17, 1936, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Before 2013, he served as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires from 1998 and was made a Cardinal in 2001 by Pope John Paul II. Following Pope Benedict XVI's unexpected resignation, the Cardinals have a very limited time for any pre-conclave political maneuvers. Despite not being a front-runner and having previously planned for retirement, Bergoglio emerges as a strong candidate in a tightly contested election, ultimately winning on the fifth ballot. Pope Francis quickly distinguishes himself with his humble, populist approach, contrasting sharply with his predecessor's style. He shuns traditional papal luxuries and focuses on outreach to the poor and marginalized. His approach to contentious issues like homosexuality, abortion, and church doctrine is more inclusive and compassionate, which resonates with many, but also sparks debates about the potential for doctrinal changes. Pope Francis was much more progressive than his predecessor. Early in his role, he refreshed church's image, appealing widely to Catholics and non-Catholics around the world. The effects of Pope Francis have fared even better for the Vatican Bank. As a result of increased mass attendance and volunteer participation in Catholic charities, the Vatican Bank receives an unprecedented amount of donations from the faithful again. In 2024, under the leadership of Pope Francis, the Vatican Bank publishes annual financial reports regularly, enhancing its transparency. While Europe and America see a decrease in the number of priests, there is an increase in Africa and Asia, indicating a shift in the geographic centers of growth within the Church. Despite its recent turbulent financial crises, the Church may have finally found a place of positive outlook for its future. There are nearly a thousand men, most celibate, who live and work together and wield not only great earthly power, but who believe, for the most part, that they have inherited divine rights and safeguarding the one and true Church. In the end, they are human, hobbled by the same frailties and shortcomings common to the rest of us. The Vatican will always be a unique presence in the world. Throughout its recent history, by embracing capitalism, the Church has engaged in many predatory practices that go against the Catholic faith. 
The global Catholic population continues to grow, reaching 1.378 billion by the end of 2021, which represents a 1.3% increase from the previous year. In the long run, regardless of its past mistakes, this powerful and seminal institution will live on.